In 1803, a man in Hammersmith, London shot a ghost. Well, more accurately, he tried to. Obviously, it didn't actually work. What actually happened was that he shot a bricklayer wearing all white, mistaking him for a specter that had been terrorizing the local neighborhood. Swiftly arrested, the man was put before a jury, who were given only two options for his fate. Guilty or not guilty. With no other choice, they rendered a guilty verdict, sentencing him to dissection and death. In a desperate attempt to escape this horrific fate, the man reached out to the king who, surprisingly sympathized with his attempt to gun down a poltergeist and commuted his sentence to a year of hard labor instead. Even more shockingly, the outcome of this trial took over 180 years to reach a full resolution in the British courts, impacting the legal system to this very day. So let's take a proper look at what happened in this strange case that altered British history as we explored the time that a man shot a ghost. Sort of, anyway. The Hammersmith Ghost Murder Case. Rarely do legal history and tales of the supernatural intertwine, but such an unusual convergence is exactly what happened in the Hammersmith Ghost Incident of 1804, a chilling episode etched into the annals of British crime history. In the midst of the shadowy tenements of 19th century London, a wave of fear swept across Hammersmith as rumors of a malevolent spirit took hold of the community. As terror metamorphosed into hysteria, an innocent man fell victim to a tragic case of mistaken identity, leaving the British courts facing a perplexing dilemma. Could a man be deemed guilty of attempting to harm a ghost? Ghostly goings-on. In the waning months of 1803, residents of Hammersmith, West London began having encounters with, and even being attacked by, a spectral presence. This ghostly apparition was rumored to be the spirit of a man who had taken his own life the previous year and found his final resting place in Hammersmith's churchyard. During this era, prevailing beliefs held that suicide victims, deemed to have committed a mortal sin, were consigned to damnation. Their bodies were denied burial in consecrated ground, as it was thought to disturb the repose of their souls. Consequently, the local populace harbored the conviction that they were haunted due to the improper burial of the suicide victim. Accounts of the ghost's appearance varied among witnesses. Some described a towering figure clad in white robes, while others insisted it wore attire made of calfskin, featuring horns and large glass-like eyes. In an era steeped in superstition, a chilling ghost story swiftly permeated the collective consciousness, triggering a surge in paranoia as accounts of the entity's attack circulated. Thomas Groom, a servant, recounted his eerie encounter with the spectral entity. I was going through the churchyard between 8 and 9 o'clock, with my jacket under my arm and my hands in my pocket when some person came from behind a tombstone, which there are four square in the yard behind me, and caught me fast by the throat with both hands and held me fast. My fellow servant who was going on before, hearing me scuffling, asked what was the matter. Then, whatever it was, gave me a twist round and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft, like a great coat. Panic swept through Hammersmith, a typical reaction to such occurrences, as rumors intertwined and took on a life of their own, especially after an alarming tale emerged, asserting that a pregnant woman had died of fright after being assaulted by the ghost. The last reported ghost sighting before tragedy unfolded transpired on December 29, 1803, when night watchman William Girdler glimpsed the apparition along Beaver Lane. In a pursuit, the ghost cunningly discarded its white shroud, vanishing from sight. This event spurred some citizens to organize armed patrols in a bid to apprehend the elusive specter. Yes, you did hear that right. Armed citizens really did go on the hunt for a ghost. Tragedy unfolds. Regrettably, the mounting hysteria culminated in a fateful encounter on January 3, 1804. Girdler crossed paths with an armed citizen, none other than 29-year-old excise officer and aspiring ghost hunter Francis Smith, who brandished a shotgun in his quest to confront the ghost. The two agreed to rendezvous at 11 p.m. under Girdler's watch in an attempt to apprehend the elusive apparition together. Shortly past 11 p.m., Smith encountered Thomas Millwood, a bricklayer making his way home after visiting his parents and sister. Millwood, wearing all white garments including impeccably washed linen trousers, a seemingly new and very white flannel waistcoat, and a wrapped apron, became the unfortunate protagonist in the unfolding tragedy. According to Anne Millwood, Thomas's sister and a witness to the encounter, Smith, in a fit of aggression, exclaimed, Damn you! Who are you and what are you? Damn you, I'll shoot you! Before fatally shooting Millwood in the head, the sound of gunfire summoned concerned neighbors who rushed to the scene, discovering a distraught Smith standing over the lifeless body. After what must have been a moment of triumph, Smith confronted the harsh reality that he had in fact committed a grave error. Advising him to depart, the crowd insisted he return home. However, before he could comply, a constable arrived and promptly arrested him. Millwood was rushed to the nearby Black Lion Inn, 
but alas, it was already too late. A surgeon named Mr. Flower conducted a post-mortem examination. Mr. Flower's findings revealed that the cause of death was a projectile from the shotgun that had penetrated the vertebrae of his neck, causing damage to the spinal marrow. As a result, Smith found himself ensnared in the precarious predicament. He had believed he had been firing his weapon at a ghost, yet he had just murdered an innocent man instead. The trial. Smith found himself on trial for willful murder at the Old Bailey later that year, and it didn't take long for the proceedings to take a dire turn for him. The trial commenced with the poignant testimony of Millwood's grieving widow, who recounted warning her husband not to wear his all-white work clothes at night. Having previously been mistaken for a ghost, her concern for his safety was, as it turned out, entirely reasonable. Damning evidence came from Millwood's sister, who vividly recalled Smith's abrupt firing, having given her brother no time to stop after being demanded to by Smith. The jury grappled with an intriguing question. Could claiming to perceive someone as a supernatural being serve as a defense against murder? Chief Judge Lord Baron Sir Archibald MacDonald then reminded the jury that premeditation wasn't a prerequisite for a guilty verdict, only the intent to kill. The judge underscored that Millwood had never posed a threat to Smith and was denied the opportunity to provoke him. Furthermore, Smith, rather than attempting to apprehend the supposed ghost, chose to shoot on sight. Consequently, the judge asserted that the killing couldn't be justified as an act of self-defense or an accidental shooting. Millwood's defense presented declarations of Smith's good character, but the judge dismissed them. He emphatically conveyed to the jury that character had no bearing on the case. Smith had unequivocally shot Millwood. The judge stressed that Millwood had committed no wrongdoing, and even if he had been feigning being a ghost, it would only constitute a minor misdemeanor, not something warranting a fatal shooting. Legal proceedings and a shift in perspective. After deliberating for an hour, the jury rendered a manslaughter verdict. The judge, instructing them that their only options were murder or acquittal, told them to go back and come to a new conclusion. Upon their return, the jury delivered a guilty verdict, leading to Smith's initial sentencing of hanging and dissection. However, after a plea to the king who surprisingly sympathized with his situation, this severe sentence was commuted to a year of hard labor instead. The crux of the case revolved around whether Smith could be held accountable for his actions, even if they stemmed from the mistaken belief that Millwood was a ghost. The judge at the time argued that Smith couldn't plead self-defense because he had never been in any real danger. Despite his error, Smith had taken a life and according to the prevailing legal stance, had to face the consequences. However, this verdict faced scrutiny, including from the king, leading to the commutation of Smith's original sentence. The question of fairness in not considering Smith's serious mistake lingered. So much so, that it took another 180 years for the English legal system to address this issue. The resolution came in the early 1980s during a different case. A man, believing he witnessed one person assaulting another, intervened and attacked the alleged assailant. However, it turned out that the supposed assailant was apprehending the other person on suspicion of theft, not attacking him. The intervening person was convicted of assault but appealed, asserting that he genuinely believed the victim was the perpetrator, even if that belief was mistaken. The judges, after careful consideration, concurred with this argument and overturned the conviction. Lord Chief Justice Lane, presiding over the appeal, acknowledged the historical nature of the debate, stating that the case raised legal issues that had been under discussion for an extensive period. He proceeded to provide clarification on the matter. In a case of self-defense where self-defense or the prevention of crime is concerned, if the jury came to the conclusion that the defendant believed, or may have believed, that he was being attacked or that a crime was being committed, and that force was necessary to protect himself or to prevent the crime, then the prosecution have not proved their case. If, however, the defendant's alleged belief was mistaken, and if the mistake was an unreasonable one, that may be a peaceful reason for coming to the conclusion that the belief was not honestly held and should be rejected. Even if the jury comes to the conclusion that the mistake was an unreasonable one, if the defendant may genuinely have been laboring under it, he is entitled to rely upon it. As a result of the appeal, the conviction was quashed, and this decision gained approval from the Privy Council in Beckford First the Queen, 1988. Subsequently, it was formally incorporated into British law through the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, Section 76. Conclusion Contemplating whether Smith would have escaped culpability for Millwood's killing if tried 180 years later remains a matter of conjecture. Smith actively sought out trouble that fateful night, and trouble indeed found him. Regardless of Smith's potential mistake, the undeniable tragedy lies in the loss of an innocent life due to a hasty trigger finger. The United Kingdom enforces stringent regulations on the use of force in self-defense, 
making it dubious that a contemporary jury would deem shooting a ghost in the head with a shotgun as reasonable force. However, a lingering question persists. Who or what was the Hammersmith ghost? Well, it wasn't solely a creation of the vivid imaginations of Londoners. A few days after the tragic demise of Thomas Millwood, a cobbler named John Graham sheepishly stepped forward, owning up to being the ghost. He disclosed that the apprentices in his workshop had been regaling his children with frightening tales. Seeking retaliation, he devised a plan to scare the apprentices by donning a white tablecloth and making nocturnal appearances. The heightened fear among Londoners did the rest. The narrative of the Hammersmith ghost serves as a striking illustration of mass hysteria. Residents in the vicinity genuinely succumbed to escalating rumors, and their paranoia culminated in a tragic fatality. Regrettably, the people of Hammersmith didn't entirely learn the lessons from the events of 1804. Two decades later, reports of sightings of the Hammersmith ghost resurfaced. This time, however, it was claimed the ghost could even breathe fire. Meanwhile, the saga of the Hammersmith ghost, along with the tragic case of Millwood and Smith, found a place of remembrance on a plaque outside the Black Lion pub, where it stands today. And with that, this strange true story comes to a close. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel and drop a comment down below. I've just set up a membership option for the channel you can join if you want to. I don't make any money from these videos yet, so any support is truly appreciated. There are a few perks available right now, such as early access to my upcoming videos, and I'll be trying to add more benefits as the channel continues to grow. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.